Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all that I do on um, my uh, Instagram page under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. From the book The Act of Life by Parker J. Palmer. Disillusionment is one of life's natural forms of contemplation. The experience of dislocation is another. This happens when we are forced by circumstance to occupy a very different standpoint from our normal one. And our angle of vision suddenly changes to reveal a strange and threatening landscape. I think, for example, of a man who lives 40 years in perfect health, until one day the doctor tells him he has terminal cancer. I think of the woman who has held the same job for 30 years until an overnight corporate takeover leaves her unemployed at age 58. I think of the person finally forced to admit that alcohol has made life so unbearable that the only choice is to change or to die. The value of dislocation, like the value of disillusionment, is in the way that it moves us beyond illusion so we can see reality in the round since what we are able to see depends entirely on where we stand. Standing in the middle of a field, it is easy to imagine that the earth is flat. Standing on the moon and looking back at our planet, we see more clearly what her true form is. Of course, contemplation that comes through dislocation is likely to leave us lonely. Others often do not share our dislocated view of things, and sometimes they are threatened by our new truth. I once heard the story of a medieval Irish monk who died and was buried, as was the custom, in the monastery wall. One day, the monks heard noises from within the wall and removed the stones to find their brother alive and well. He began to tell them what he had learned on his journey beyond. And everything he he said was contrary to the teachings of the church. So the brothers put him back in the wall and sealed the crypt forever. This story suggests that one more way that life draws us into accidental contemplation. The way of unbidden solitude. Some of us find it as hard to choose solitude as to choose dislocation or disillusionment because solitude removes us from the collective life that often reinforces our comforting illusions. But life sends many moments when the group excludes us willy-nilly. Moments when we say or feel or do something that the group does not want to deal with. Moments when we are forced to find our way without collective support. In these moments, we once again have the chance to penetrate illusion and touch reality. Solitude is a painful condition at first, as are disillusionment and dislocation. But unlike those two, solitude is something that sometimes grows on people. There's a reason for this. Disillusionment and dislocation are temporary conditions passages we must make in order to move beyond illusion and live in truth. But involuntary solitude is the permanent truth of our lives. We are born in solitude. We die in solitude. And we have opportunities to learn to live creatively with the fact, with that fact in the years between birth and death. The fruit of disillusionment and dislocation is the capacity to enter and enjoy our solitude compelled by the painful grace of a life process that is bent on helping us to, quote, get real, unquote. Solitude is not simply physical isolation. It is easy to be alone and yet continue to be in the crowd, to be governed by collective values. And it is possible to be physically in the midst of a crowd and yet to be in solitude. 
To be in solitude means to be in possession of my heart, my identity, my integrity. It means to refuse to let my life and my meanings be dis dictated by other people or by an impersonal culture. To be in solitude is to claim my birthright, birthright of aliveness on its own terms, terms that respect the life around me but do not demean my own. The solitary is someone who, to paraphrase Thomas Merton, is to be able to give her heart away because it is in her possession to give a possession not possible when we are caught in the silent conspiracy of collective illusions. So, solitude is not antithetical to community. The poet Rilke once defined love as the capacity of two solitudes to protect and border and greet one another. And that kind of love is the key to the paradoxical relationship of solitude and community. The healthy community is one that leaves the solitude, the integrity, of each individual intact. If its members do not respect their own solitude, they will continually violate the sol solitude of others. The only thing we have to bring to a community is ourselves. So the contemplative process of recovering our true selves in solitude is never selfish. It is ultimately the best gift we can give to others. Austin Kleon says in his book, Steal Like an Artist, be boring. It's the only way to get work done. Be regular and orderly in your life so that you may be violent and original in your work. Gustav Flambert take care of yourself. I'm a boring guy with a nine to five job who lives in a quiet neighborhood with his wife and his dog. That whole romantic image of the creative genius doing drugs and running around and sleeping with everyone is played out. It's for the superhuman and the people who want to die young. The thing is, it takes a lot of energy to be creative. You don't have that energy if you waste it on other stuff. It's best to assume that you'll be alive for a while. It's for this reason that Patti Smith tells young artists to go to the dentist. Eat breakfast, do some push-ups, go for the long walks, get plenty of sleep. Neil Young sang, it's better to burn out than to fade away. I say it's better to burn slow and see your grandkids. And stay out of debt. Most people I know hate to think about money. Do yourself a favor, learn about money as soon as you can. My grandpa used to say to my dad, son, it's not the money you make, it's the money you hold on to. Make yourself a budget, live within your means, pack your lunch, pinch pennies, save as much as you can, get the education you need for as cheap as you can get it. The art of holding on to money is all about saying no to co consumer culture, saying no to takeout, $4 lattes, shiny new computers when the old one still works fine. Keep your day job. The truth is that even if you're lucky enough to make a living doing what you truly love, it will probably take you a while to get to that point. And until then, you need a day job. A day job gives you money, a connection to the world, and a routine. Freedom from financial stress also means freedom in your art. As photographer Bill Cunningham says, if you don't take money, they can't tell you what to do. A day job puts you in the path of other human beings. Learn from them, steal from them. I've tried to take jobs where I can learn things that I can use in my work later. My library job taught me how to do research. My web design job taught me how to build websites. My copywriting job taught me how to sell things with words. The worst thing a day job does is take time away from you. But it makes up for that by giving you a daily routine in which you can schedule a regular time for your creative pursuits. 
Establishing and keeping a routine can be even more important than having a lot of time. Inertia is the death of creativity. You have to stay in the groove. When you get out of the groove, you start to dread the work because you know it's going to suck for a while. It's going to suck until you get back in the flow. The solution is really simple. Figure out what time you can carve out, what time you can steal, and stick to your routine. Do the work every day no matter what. No holidays, no sick days. Don't stop. What you'll probably find is that the uh, corollary to Parkinson's law is usually true. Work gets done in the time available. Nobody's saying it's going to be fun. A lot of times it will feel as if you're living a double life. The poet Philip Larkin said the best thing to do is to try to be utterly schizoid about it all, using each personality as a refuge from the other. The trick is to find a day job that pays decently, doesn't make you want to vomit, and leaves you with enough energy to make things in your spare time. Good day jobs aren't necessarily easy to find, but they're out there. Daniel Laporte in her book, White Not Truth. Leo Tolstoy says, free thinkers are those who are willing to use their minds without prejudice and without fearing to understand things that clash with their own customs, privileges, or beliefs. This state of mind is not common, but it is essential for right thinking. The lie of affiliation says, group think is good think. A byproduct of the lie of authority, we could also call this the lie of being cool. Yikes. No. Flashback. I'm one of those personal development workshops where the apparently evolved guy who has more money than everyone in the room is working his neural linguistic programming kung fu to get participants to share their deepest secrets with a group of utter strangers. What? You were there? Thought I recognized you. Who wants to share next? Asked the leader guy into the microphone. There are only 30 of us in a small conference room. He doesn't require a mic to be heard, but you know, spectacle. He doesn't wait for anyone to volunteer. He zooms in on Pablo because it's obvious that Pablo is scared, shitless. Now, I naturally gravitate to the sweet, scared guys in the group settings because I'm a natural mama bear, and it's easy to make the kind and quivery guys laugh. It's a win-win. So I was sitting next to Pablo, noticing that he'd balled up tissue in both hands to help with his sweating palms. I looked at him to say, dude, it's your call. Leader guy walks Pablo through his proprietary and trademark pending series of spirit-cracking questions, and right on cue, Pablo gets into his childhood story. An obese and verbally abusive mother living in a house of total squalor and infestation, being sexually abused by a relative, it went on. It got worse, unspeakable, unless you're in a group workshop. Unspeakably worse. That abuse resulted in all kinds of neurosis and obsessive compulsive behavior in adulthood. He cried through his story and all the emotionally available people in the room joined in on him, with him. Leader guy walked him through the final phase of the Q and grueling A. And then, I kid you not, he signaled all of us to group hug Pablo while the workshop DJ in the back of the room played Winona Judd's cover of Foreigners' I Want to Know What Love Is. You can't make this shit up, but you can pay $795 plus accommodations for it. At dinner, one of the spirit-intoxicated attendees says to me, Isn't this wonderful? That sharing that Pablo did is going to change his life. I looked up for my bowl of quinoa and said, Maybe. But I think when he gets back to work on Monday, he's going to regret the shit out of this. Because some things are too sacred for a fluorescent lit conference room. There are some things you should only tell your qualified therapist or your best friend in the sanctity of a private space when you're truly ready. 
And that's how the real healing begins. With respect and skill, not manipulation. But groups get it out of us, don't they? We tend to love the comfort of belonging, even if it's belonging to miserable company. And leaders take the heat off of us to do the work themselves. And the leaders take the heat off of us to do the work ourselves, if only temporarily. And all we have to do is spill the beans and cry, and we're welcomed right in. But a few days later, we wake up with a wicked spiritual hangover. Wanting to be affiliated with a cause or a group can get more convoluted when we're getting together for spiritual reasons. It's not like we're meeting to strategize strategize Ponzi schemes or kidnappings. We're getting together to make the world a better place, man. Who's going to stand up in the how to be more loving retreat to say, the workshop leader, workshop leader is being mean to people, and this is total bullshit? That would not seem very loving. We experience group, group enchantment to divine our individual, individuality. We enlist, we play, we promote, we wake up, we leave the flock. And then we go find where we truly belong. May you find your tribe and love them hard.